I'm Jane Witte. And I'm Nick Nolte. We are both senior consultants at Capacity Interactive, and together we have over 20 years of arts marketing experience. Um, I think we're a little behind, but um, so we also, are we there? Oh, there we go, yay. I was like, where's our beautiful picture? Um, so, you might also recognize Nick and I as the stars of the 80s themed workout video intro from a couple years back. And you thought Seth Godin was gonna be the biggest star of this contest. <laughs> when we are not wearing spandex, we're working with our teams to support the digital marketing efforts of a variety of organizations. In addition to campaign work, we have each partnered with a number of organizations on their website redesign projects. And these projects are long hauls, and as Eric mentioned, they are not always easy, but we've learned a thing or two along the way, and we're here this afternoon to share some of those learnings with you all. So if you're currently in the middle of a redesign project, and if you are, come see us at happy hour tonight for some free <laughs> therapy. Um, the information that we're gonna walk through today is really for you. And even if you are not in the middle of a redesign, we know from this year's benchmark study that arts organizations are redesigning their websites on average every 5.3 years. So if it doesn't apply to you today, it can and should soon enough. All right, before we get into what we've learned, let's zero in on the fact that our website is really the center of our digital marketing universe. This is where we are sending our patrons through all of our online and even our offline efforts. So it's really the most important tool of our digital marketing strategy. The Performing Arts Ticket Buyer Study that Wolf Brown conducted with Capacity Interactive last year showed that 79% of ticket buyers prefer to buy their tickets online. And 77% of buyers are arriving on your website to view content about upcoming programming. In fact, the study showed that 95% of ticket buyers who responded to the study bought their tickets online once in the previous year, at least once, and 37% of those bought on a smartphone at least once. So now more than ever, though it's been true for some time now, our patron's path to purchase is long and complex, it crosses multiple devices, and it relies on mobile as a necessary step. You're gonna hear more about the digital path to purchase from Google's own Luke Roadhorst in the house somewhere uh, this afternoon after lunch. But for now, just remember that we have a responsibility to make our websites look good and actually work across these devices. So unfortunately, smaller organizations with smaller budgets don't get a free pass for having a lackluster mobile experience. This year's digital marketing benchmark study found that no matter your organization's size or budget, the percentage of mobile visitors to arts organizations' website is largely the same at 43%. Now this percentage is only going to grow as time marches forward, and as you heard from Kathleen yesterday, we are now in a mobile first indexing algorithm, meaning that Google is going to rank your site and index it based on the mobile website rather than the desktop experience. So we're all on the hook for having a good mobile experience all the way through the purchase path. However, we know that only 14% of organizations say that the mobile version of their ticketing and select your own seat path is highly usable and up to their visual standard. You know, it is a bit depressing to see this low percentage in this day and age, but we know as arts organizations, we're all resource thin. And we also are often reliant on third-party ticketing partners, as you heard from Eric earlier. So I have to say this isn't really surprising. Uh, we do aim to see this percentage go up as we more proactively address these challenges. I'm guessing a good chunk of you remember this. <laughs> oh. It's supposed to play the <laughs> da 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 <laughs> 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 I'll save you the next two and a half minutes of it. <laughs> uh, I played this for my 12-year-old nephew a few months back, and he looked at me wide-eyed, and he had absolutely no idea what it was. And he said, it sounds like a nuclear bomb warning. 
just blew my mind and led me into one of my first major age-related crises. <laughs> <laughs> but we know, oh, mind-blowing. A lot has changed in the last two decades. Not only do we need to design across different devices, now we are accustomed to everything on the internet being lightning fast. And if it's not fast, it's going to lose our attention very quickly. According to Google, 53% of mobile users are going to abandon a site that takes longer than three seconds to load. And you heard this from Kathleen yesterday, but it's worth reiterating that for every second in page load time, conversions can fall by up to 20%. So at the end of the day, a website that isn't fast and easy to use across devices is going to cost our organization in ticket sales and donations. All right. Without further ado, let's get into 10 things we've learned redesigning arts websites. Number one, understand the magnitude of what you're building. Our wise friend Tom O'Connor, who many of you in the room know, and who we call the most networked man in the arts on our See Eye to Eye podcast, <laughs> coined a saying that is so true and useful to remember as you're thinking about your website and what it actually is. That saying goes, your website is a building not a brochure. This isn't something that you can throw together and then ship off at the last minute, like you would maybe your fall brochure, never to think of much again, which unfortunately is a mindset that we do run into time and time again, still with arts organizations. We often hear, <laughs> I have $30,000 and four months to launch a new website. How does that sound? <laughs> I've actually heard that. <laughs> This is where I need to silence the Jacqueline Vory's voice in my head <laughs> before I remember that for a significant chunk of smaller organizations, even $30,000 is a large chunk of money. This is a type of money that you, can you can't spend all the time on a project. But this really requires a shift in thinking, as you would spend months raising funds to build a new theater or concert hall for your patrons. You're going to want to bring that same mentality to your digital home by spending a significant amount of money and time here. The benchmark study found that nearly half of organizations across all budget sizes report that an insufficient amount of money is allocated to their website. Now this ranks at the second, second biggest website related challenge behind uh, organizations facing challenges, behind technical limitations with their ticketing system and CRM. So this clearly shows that we as an industry a, are not yet prioritizing an appropriate investment in our websites, and B, spoiler alert, we as an industry are severely under-resourced across the board. But we aren't going to get into the exact numbers of what a website's going to cost or should cost you. Sorry about that. Jane's going to tell you why that is in a little bit. But in the meantime, to preface that budget convo, I will just say that, as with most things, you are going to get what you pay for. Number two. When your organization commits to going down the long road of a website redesign, it's very important to plan for a meaningful internal discovery session before you do much of anything else. Discovery is a fancy way of saying an investigative meeting used to uncover challenges, form a strategy, and to learn more about a project's requirements. This is really the time to invite your employees to the table, and it should serve as like a pep rally of sorts to get everyone energized and excited about building a new website. As you plan for these discovery sessions with your departments, first you're gonna to want to decide who the key stakeholders and decision makers are going to be during the process. Who are the folks responsible for making the important decisions at the end of the day? Who's going to keep the project on time and on budget? We call this the working team, and this should be a small and agile team, keywords small and agile, and this team should meet first to bring some order and structure to what it is you're actually going to be building. So way before you hire a website design partner, get this working team to identify your primary goals, or as we like to call them, your key performance indicators or your KPIs. Do you want to increase your online ticket sales and donations? Probably yes, right? <laughs> or increasing engagement with content on your production detail pages, things like that and try to define these as things you're actually going to be able to measure once your new site is live. This is also the time to decide upon who is going to be the point person and project manager for the redesign on your organization side. Are you going to appoint someone internally, or do you have the funds to hire someone externally to manage this project? 
Keep in mind that the project manager role is basically a full-time job once you commit to a website design partner. This is the person who's going to be scheduling meetings, making sure all of the reviews, decisions, and approvals are made on time, and also liaising between the many people on your organization side and also on the website design partner side. Now, there are pros and cons to hiring someone externally versus keeping this internal. It may be the best fit for your organization to say, appoint someone on your marketing team to fill these shoes whose day-to-day -day roles can temporarily be reassigned while, you, uh, while this project is happening, and then you, know, you can pick back up after that. But this is a call you'll really have to make based on your staffing and your resources. I will say briefly that project management used to be uh, in the wheelhouse of Capacity Interactive, but uh, since we are digital marketers, we now leave this to the many qualified and capable project managers there are <laughs> out in the world. Uh, as Eric Gensler says, a culture of learning. <laughs> now, once you have your working team set, your KPIs defined, and your project manager appointed, invite a significant constituency of your organization to have their voices heard in discovery sessions. And don't forget about the folks who work on the front line or in the box office, as these are often the folks who are going to be most well-versed in your patrons' issues on your website. Encourage everyone to bring their pain points with the current site and also their hopes and dreams for a new site, and really use this as a time to think big. Not only can a, great, a lot of great ideas come out of these discovery sessions, but it also can really help everyone feel like they're being brought along for the ride. Now that we've heard all of the thoughts and feelings from everyone in all of your departments, Jane, will you please tell us who we should actually be designing for? You bet. So you might be able to guess by this giant slide over my head that we feel very strongly you should be designing for the users of your websites. We have all agreed to think of the website like a building, and you need to design that building with its users' needs in mind. It can be tempting to think that as active users of our organization's websites, that we are the best equipped to determine what is and isn't working with the site. But we have found that time and time again that just isn't true. Our users are truly the best resource for information on what is and is not working. But how do you know what your users need and want? Um, so we have, sorry, I just totally got lost. Um, we're, so we're in a really exciting time right now. I'm so excited about it. Um, so many tools that were once unavailable to arts marketers because they were too expensive or technologically challenging to implement have become available. So to, let's take a look at some of those tools. Your website analytics is hands down the best place to start. You likely already have Google Analytics implemented on your website, and this tool is gathering valuable aggregate data. Google Analytics can tell us information about visitor demographics, information from mobile devices that can help us inform designing from a mobile-first perspective, and also behavioral information across pages and page types on the site. It's important to note that an out-of-the-box Google Analytics implementation is lacking. So if you want to track specific site functionality, if there's any custom action that haven't built on, out on your website, you're going to need a custom Google Analytics implementation to track that activity. We would definitely recommend setting this up in advance of any analysis so that you have the most robust data to work with when you're going through and looking at all of that information that's coming out of your website. For organizations that we have partnered with at Capacity Interactive, an analysis of your website data is really the first step in gathering that super important user data. Despite your website analytics being so invaluable and in many ways low-hanging fruit, we found from this year's benchmark study that only 25% of organizations listed their website analytics as a major input in their last redesign. You can see that is nearly tied with the opinions of the leadership or board. <laughs> I think we can all imagine an example of what this might look like, but I'll give you one in case you just cannot think of what that would be. Um, 
So you might have a member of your board who thinks that you should put a donate now button across every page of your website, right? <laughs> Maybe, couldn't possibly sound familiar. Um, but if we look to our website data, we could see that perhaps only 0.5% of the people coming to our website are looking to make a donation. So while input from your leadership and board is important, designing for the user means that you've made a decision to put data above your gut feelings. So A-B testing is another really powerful tool. This allows you to run tests of small tweaks to the design or functional elements of your website to determine what changes you might want to incorporate into a future redesign. Um, if you came to bootcamp last year, you've heard us talk about A-B testing a lot. Obviously, we're really excited about it. Um, so in a test that we ran for Wolf Trap, looking at their mobile homepage specifically, we wanted to see if changing this from a page with a really singular call out to something that focused on a listing of events would increase traffic to the performance detail pages across their site. So here in the test version, we removed that hero image from the homepage. This change resulted in an incredibly strong 6.5% increase in views of the performance detail pages across Wolftrap's site. Traffic to our performance detail pages is incredibly valuable. So an increase of 6.5% likely represents thousands of dollars in additional revenue. Again, A-B testing allows us to determine if some of those gut instincts that we're feeling would actually improve the user experience if they were incorporated into a redesign. Site surveys are another tool that allow us to gather qualitative information from active users of our websites. So you can see the survey here, kind of in the bottom left hand corner. Um, in this survey specifically, we were asking users about their reason for visiting the site. Options included learn more about upcoming programming, make a donation, make a purchase, et cetera. This way, we can use data from Google Analytics and match it with the information that we're getting through from the survey tool to see if our websites are actually meeting the goals that users are saying that they're coming to our site to take. And most importantly, I would say, if you're going to ask users information about why they're coming to your site, about their wants and needs, you need to make sure that you have a plan to incorporate that information into the redesign of the site. Yay, it's playing. Uh, so one of the really exciting tools, in my opinion, of evaluating on-site behavior is through user videos. So here, <laughs> we use a tool called Hotjar, and this is actually the same tool that we use to run site surveys. They're implemented kind of through the same setup process. These videos show behavior of real users on our websites. Kind of scary, kind of exciting. <laughs> um, <laughs> they can add color and give life to that aggregate information that we are getting from Google Analytics. In this example, you can see a user is desperately attempting to buy tickets. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, the tickets are actually not on sale yet for this program. But nothing on the landing page is telling them that. <laughs> and by their frantic scrolling, you can see that they're becoming frustrated. <laughs> Much like our friend here, they're <laughs> screaming and losing their mind. Um, so this person actually left the website without taking any action at all. Obviously not the goal. User personas. So these are a fun exercise that allow us to put a name and sometimes a face, if you're feeling creative, to a typical fictionalized user group of our website. We at Capacity incorporate these into all of the requests for proposals that we create. More on RFPs in just a second. Um, but they really help give potential web developers uh, more information about our users. It is important to remember that a website developer isn't going to inherently understand our constituency. So giving them this information in the RFP is incredibly helpful for them throughout the process. Um, you will want to focus on the personas that make up the majority of the traffic to your site. This could be single ticket buyers, 
subscribers or members, people who are new to our site, et cetera. Once you have identified these groups, you're gonna to wanna to call out their frustrations or challenges with the current site and opportunities to serve them better on a new site. Um, and you should be using all of the tools that we have just discussed, so your website analytics, any site surveys that you might do to really infuse your personas with as much real user data as possible. Again, we shouldn't be drawing on our gut feeling about who's visiting our website, we should use the data that we have. So as promised, number four, write an RFP. You wouldn't start building a house without a blueprint, right? So why would you start in a project as impactful to the success of your organization without a document to guide that process? A request for proposal, or RFP, is that document. The goal of the RFP is to give the potential website partner the information that they'll need to respond to the RFP with a strong proposal. An RFP will help give you a document as well that you can use internally throughout the process to help guide and prioritize decision making. So when you're in the middle of arguing over the order of items in the main navigation, <laughs> which like, yeah, happens, <laughs> um, you can think back to the, the process that you went through to create the RFP and remember that you agreed to design for the user and not for your organization's wants and needs. It might even help settle that argument in a way that reduces some of that workplace tension, maybe. An RFP is not a replacement for the conversations that you'll have with the website partner that you ultimately choose. Um, you're still gonna wanna have all those creative conversations and really you know, get into the weeds with them, but for a project as technical and all-encompassing as a website redesign, creating an RFP is really essential. So, what should you include? As a warning, we're gonna get into the weeds in this section. It is not going to be the most exciting, <laughs> but sometimes you gotta eat your veggies. <laughs> and the RFP is definitely the vegetable of the website redesign process. <laughs> so here we go. Scope and timeline. Here is where you will share the overarching elements of the project. Is it a redesign of both the front and back end of the site, or are you looking for a, a designer to reskin your current site? You should also include some really important timeline elements here, such as when you expect a vendor to respond to your RFP, when you'll be selecting a designer or developer for the project, and of course, your proposed launch date. Brief overview of the organization. Who are you? What type of programming do you create and who do you serve? Including a bit of information about your organization is helpful for a potential developer to understand your needs and wants. Stakeholders. We suggest in introducing your potential website partner to the working team that you have selected and also to the person who will be project managing the project, whether that is someone internal or external. This lets a potential website partner know that you have selected a team of people who will help facilitate decision making and also that you have someone who will serve as their main point of contact throughout the project. What are your main objectives with the new site and how do you plan to measure success? A main objective might be increase earned revenue with a key result being increased mobile conversion rates. These objectives should come out of your internal discovery and of course be user focused. We would suggest limiting this to four main objectives. More than that, and you're likely to confuse a vendor as to your priorities, and it's a sign that more internal focusing is likely needed. Website personas. So we just discussed these. If you create them, definitely include them in the RFP and share them with a potential website partner. We would recommend sharing some example websites that you and your colleagues really admire and look to for inspiration. This can help also inspire a potential website developer. Required features and functionality. This is where you will detail the specific features and functional elements that are required with the new site. We would recommend breaking this out by page template type, area of the site, or a large functionality requirement. 
So for example, if you have a purchase path section, you might want to list that you require in-cart donation roundup functionality or a view from your seat feature. This section is really going to be the meat of the RFP, so be prepared to spend some time here. What's your current technical structure? So how is the site hosted? What CMS do you use, et cetera? This is the technical information that a developer will need to know. Lastly, you'll want to share with potential website partners the details on what you are expecting in a response from them. Most vendors have a pretty robust response template that they will be utilizing, but if you require something really specific from them in their response, you're gonna wanna call that out. This is also where we would recommend sharing the project budget. We keep teasing that, but I promise we'll talk about it a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> so, keep it simple and reader focused. So just like your website needs to be designed with the user's needs in mind, you're gonna wanna write the RFP with the potential website partner's perspective in mind. I know I have just listed a lot of areas information and an RFP is going to be a hefty document, but your goal should keep it simple and reader focused. A potential website partner needs to know what your needs and wants are for the new site and the things that aren't working with the current site. They don't need to know every problem you have ever had <laughs> with the current site. You don't need to catalog every grievance. That was really what that internal discovery was for. Um, and remember, you are also selling yourself in the RFP. You want to get a potential website partner excited to work with you. Number five, build a realistic timeline. <laughs> 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 so now that you have gotten organizational buy-in and have begun collecting user data, you're pretty much ready for that new website to launch in like a couple of months, right? Here's where I'm gonna let Phoebe answer for me. Stop the madness. You need to budget an adequate amount of time to ensure a project of this scale is successful. The website projects that Nick and I have been involved in have ranged in terms of timeline, but none of them, from creation of the RFP to delivery of the final product, have taken less than a year, and many of them have taken much longer than that. The design and development firms that you've submitted to will be looking to the timeline you provide in your RFP, and this will be a factor in determining their ability to take on the project, so please be reasonable in this phase. If you're aiming for this, know that you cannot have it all. <laughs> I'm gonna go, I'm done, right? Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> a tight timeline means that the project is going to cost more. So we're now going to share three specific lessons that we have learned the hard way. Ooh, that was kind of scary. <laughs> um, in regards to timeline. Don't tie the timeline to a specific internal milestone. Don't do it. Um, so this might seem counterintuitive, right? What better time to launch a website than with our 25th anniversary season, the opening of a new performance? Oh, I see that's resonating. That's resonating. Okay. Um, or really even just your season on sale. Um, you know, but trust me, when the website is delayed, and it will be delayed at some point, and you're rushing to migrate content or resolve bugs on the new site while also finalizing print materials for the upcoming season, um, or building out events in Testatura, you will think back to this moment in time and wish that you had heeded our warnings. <laughs> Another important factor is that none of your external constituency are as focused on that internal milestone as you are. They will not notice if the site launches a couple months into the season. What they absolutely will notice is a site that is buggy or a purchase path that isn't functional because the website was rushed to launch to keep up with that internal milestone. 
Given this, we would highly recommend pushing the launch date if needed, rather than trying to keep pace with that milestone at the expense of the website project. And remember, you can always find a way to celebrate that milestone event on your current site, be that by you know, building out a special landing page or through visual imagery across the site. The vendors that you have submitted to will need time to craft a thorough response to your RFP. Um, and this will often involve asking some clarifying questions. So you need to make sure that not only are you giving them time, but that you are making yourself available during that time so that they can come to you with those questions. A good response is one that addresses the element within the RFP and shows that they understand the needs of the project. So you want to make sure the deadline that you list for responses is gonna give them time to do that. If you state that you expect a developer to respond in two weeks or less, this could be a signal that you have an unrealistic set of expectations for the project that might carry throughout your work with them. We would recommend giving at least three weeks for a website partner to respond to your RFP, um, and more time if you can. Don't forget about contract negotiations. I had to get a cat meme in here. Just, <laughs> anyone who knows me knows I really like cats, so I did it. <laughs> Once you have selected a website partner, they will create a contract or a statement of work that details the project components and includes specific legal language around the responsibilities for each party. This is not a formality. This is an incredibly important document, um, and you really need to make sure that you're paying attention to what the potential website partner is agreeing to deliver to you at the conclusion of that project. This is the part where I will state that I am not a lawyer, and I imagine that most of you are not either, so we highly recommend bringing in legal counsel during this phase and having them review that contract or statement of work before you sign. We have seen contracts come through that do not guarantee the completion of a finished product um, and rather only commit the developer to a certain number of hours spent creating a new website for you. But X number of hours spent working on a website doesn't always equal a website. Um, so it can have a huge negative impact on the outcome of this project if you're not paying attention during this phase. We are here, number six, make a smart budget. So a few parts of the planning process for a website redesign are as fraught or possibly tension inducing as determining the budget. If you have never embarked on one of these projects before, how do you know what is reasonable? You might be hearing numbers from your executive leadership or board, but how do you know if that is enough to deliver the website you ultimately know your organization needs? <clears throat> now, as Nick mentioned, we are not going to tell you what a new website should cost or even give you a range. Um, it varies so much project to project and organization to organization that getting into specifics like that just really isn't helpful. Um, what we will do is give you some tips and tricks to think about framing this conversation of how much your website should cost. Um, most designers and developers do price based on the hours that it takes to complete a project. So a custom CRM and ticketing integration is going to cost more than an out-of-the-box solution. So keep that in mind when thinking about budgeting. Think back to that good, fast, cheap image. We know we can't have all three. So as you prioritize one, something else is going to give. Um, so if you need a finished product in a short period of time, it's going to cost more. So while you don't need Scrooge McDuck levels of funding, you do want to make sure a project of this scale is funded accordingly. We understand the frustrations of working with an outdated website that just doesn't meet your needs any longer, but we would seriously recommend waiting until you have enough budget to start a project. 
Um, if the final budget that you are able to secure is below what you know to be possible, think about delaying the start of the project a year and trying to raise more funds. In the meantime, you can do some iterative updates to address those areas of the site that you just cannot live with any longer. Most of us are bad at delayed gratification. <laughs> I know I am. But waiting until you have the funds available to start a project like this is always going to be a worthwhile wait. We, oh yeah, don't, don't be coy, see, get it? Mm -hmm. It's a joke. Uh, we always recommend including the budget in the information that you share with a potential website partner. A potential website partner needs to know at least a ballpark of what they are being asked to work with to return a realistic response. So we would recommend listing 80% of the funds that you have available as the project budget in the RFP, keeping 80% as a reserve for when additional costs come up. 20. We, 20%. 20%. 20% as a reserve. Yeah. Math. <laughs> Math. You know, not good at it. Never have been. 20%, thanks, Nick. Um, so yeah, so that 20%, we like to call it the oh shit fund. <laughs> call, it, call it what you want. Um, so, now I'm going to do more math, so <laughs> let's keep our fingers crossed. So if you have $400,000 as your total project budget, and that means you're going to list $320,000, I think I did it, um, as the project budget in the RFP, keeping that 80 k in your oh shit fund. If you somehow managed to emerge from this project not having had to dip into that 80K, and if you did, let us know how you did it, because we want to know, um, you can then invest that remaining money in user testing, a more robust analytics setup, better SEO on your new site, or you can bank that money with your developer to use for future website updates. That way you're spending all of the money that you have assigned to the project now, um, but you're putting that essentially in a reserve so that you have those funds available to spend with the developer down the line. So now that I have talked about some things to keep in mind when beginning to plan for a website redesign, I'm gonna hand it back to Nick to walk through some of the considerations for once the project gets underway. Thanks, Jane. All right, all right. So I'd love to stress the importance of being a good partner throughout a website redesign, all the way from the point when, way back when you receive the responses to your vendor RFP, um, all the way through post-launch. So you're going to be investing a lot of time and money here, and the quickest way for a project like this to derail or spin out of control is if you allow your relationship with your website partner to turn negative. So get out your opera glasses. For starters, when you're reviewing these responses, above and beyond making sure that they're addressing all of the needs that you lay out in the RFP, pay close attention to their past work, and also make sure you're getting a good sense of who the actual people are who are going to be working on your project. Have conversations with this team and get to know their working style and how they operate. Are they going to set a swift yet realistic timeline that's going to work for you and your team? Do you get the sense that they're going to good, do a good job of pushing deliverables to you, or do you think you're going to have to be chasing them down, uh, pulling things out of them? Things like that. And also, it's worth considering if you're going to be a small fish in a big pond, or vice versa, in terms of their client load. Uh, is your website going to be deprioritized when their project with, say, Apple goes into overdrive? So a very important question to ask is who is going to be the project manager on the website partner's side? In addition to making sure this is an exceptional, nearly superhuman person <laughs> filling this role, make sure your personality is mesh, because this is a person who you're going to be in daily contact with, uh, to, and this is probably the most important singular person to keeping your project on time and on budget. So in the wise words of RuPaul, vet wisely and don't. <laughs> Fuck it up. Thank you, Chrissy. <laughs> Once you decide on a website partner and are negotiating the contract, do your best not to nickel and dime. It's best to come at this with a mindset of generosity. 
Don't try to get them to knock $2,500 off the price tag just because you want to practice your negotiation skills. <laughs> We're all resource constrained, we know this, but it's also important to remember that a lot of these website partners are also running their own small businesses. So going too far with the negotiations can make you look a little stingy and it can kind of set the project off on the wrong footing. This is also going to help you mitigate your oh shit moment. So this is the moment in the project when something comes up, something that was never accounted for in the RFP or in the website partner discovery or even in the beginning of the design phase and now you're deep in the design phase and you wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and you remember something that needs to be accounted for like ASAP. So this is the moment that your website partner dreads. They're going to need to account for it as soon as possible. And chances are, if you are generous with them from the get-go, they may be more generous with you and not even charge you for that oh shit moment, maybe. <laughs> this afternoon, you're gonna hear from Bonnie Siegler. Bonnie, uh, not to steal her thunder, she's the author of a great book called Dear Client. This book will teach you how to get what you want from creative people. It's awesome. Uh, she talks about how clients can benefit from being open and collaborative and giving more, and just how it's better to be open than suspicious. This is really great advice for all types of clients, but particularly clients of a long website redesign. Staying open and collaborative is going to help you from the relationship going sour after that initial honeymoon phase. You're in this project for the long haul and there are going to be bumps in the road, but there really isn't time for those microaggressions or toxic attitudes. We know, we've seen it. Um, so don't let them format your organization. And while the project, you know, while it will be challenging, it ultimately is supposed to be rewarding and fun. And the only way it's going to be rewarding and fun is if your relationship with your website partner is in a good place. All right, number eight. One thing we've learned that almost never gets the attention it deserves is content migration. This probably isn't going to rank in your top 10 sexiest moments of your website redesign, which can lead to coping through avoidance. But in order for your project to stay on track, you do want to plan for this early on. So try to come at it with a positive attitude. Nick, you're making this sound tedious and scary. <laughs> It kind of is. <laughs> Content migration is exactly what it sounds like. It's moving all of the images, videos, and text from your old site to your new site, all before it goes live. After all, a new site can't launch naked. It needs to be fully dressed and looking good. So ultimately, your team is going to be the responsible party here, not your designers or your developers, which can often be confusing, uh, but this is ultimately potential for delaying a site launch if it's not attacked early on. So ideally, this process should start as soon as there's a finalized design of your page templates and there's a develop development site available to start to populate. So think of it as your moving day or more realistically, weeks or more realistically, months, maybe. <laughs> Instead of just taking all of the old rusty copy that exists on your old site that was written six years ago when it last launched and shoehorning it into your new site, this is a perfect time to clean house if we're staying with the building metaphor. You're going to want to make a keep pile and a toss pile for all of the content that currently exists. You want your new home to feel clean and modern and beautiful, so don't get lazy and just stuff it full of all of your old junk. Use it really as a time to reevaluate your organizational voice on the web, what kinds of videos and photos are most impactful, and start anew in a way. Now, once you have a solid plan for content migration and are packing up that keep pile, get your whole team involved or hire some interns if necessary. This is really going to be an all hands on deck part of the project, so the more hands you have on deck, the less stress you're going to feel leading up to the launch. Now, I've never given birth, nor do I plan to any time in the future, <laughs> but I will say that launching a site that I project managed from conception is probably the closest thing I've experienced to <laughs> labor. So it's emotionally fraught, <laughs> stressful, painful, but ultimately it's beautiful and rewarding and hashtag worth it. <laughs> but 
as with birth, it's going to go most smoothly if you have a plan in place. <laughs> okay, I swear I had this in here before I saw Seth's presentation yesterday. I'm not copying it. Um, so in the final weeks and days uh, leading up to the launch, you're going to be feeling like Lucy here. You're going to be stuffing what you can in your bra, and things are just going to be flying past you. There are going to be bugs in the functionality, things on the site aren't going to, the dev site aren't going to be working as they should, and you and your developer are going to be spending long hours working out these bugs. So do yourself a favor and decide what is absolutely launch critical. You aren't going to want to launch a new website if something major like the purchase path isn't working, obviously. But if there is a minor bug here or there, it's not going to be the end of the world if you launch and then address that afterward. Now, what you see here is a custom dashboard that we started creating for clients recently, which was a brainchild of Yosef Cohen, who's our vice president of analytics. Uh, this can be a life-saving tool to monitor issues with a new website so as to minimize and catch errors, including identifying those 404 page not founds, uh, things like JavaScript errors, high bounce rates, low load times, things like that. Now, a dashboard like this is something that we recommend looking at daily after the new site launch. Most website warranties are only going to last for 30 days post-launch, so you're going to want to get any major issues identified and fixed in those 30 days in order to avoid unforeseen costs. And also, just as, an, as important as it was to have a robust Google Analytics set up on your old site to evaluate what users were doing, it's imperative that your new site is tagged appropriately. So you're able to measure what users are doing once it launches. This is really the only way you're going to be able to measure if the primary goals that were laid out in your RFP are actually met. Another thing that almost always gets overlooked pre-launch is how SEO or search engine optimization is being addressed on your new site. So in our experience, web developers will do, they usually do not consider SEO to be part of their responsibility or expertise and will provide little, if any, baseline coverage. So organic search is always going to take a hit when your new site launches, as search engines need to crawl and re-index that site. But having thorough SEO tags built out uh, pre-launch is going to help minimize loss in organic search. So it's definitely worth addressing this as you're populating content on your new site. Now, while project management isn't something that Capacity Interactive works on anymore, uh, we can help out with implementing launch plans, analytic setups, and SEO best practices. Uh, all right, Jane, bring us on home with number 10. <laughs> number 10, plan for iterative updates. You've launched a new website. Congratulations. It's time to not have to think about this process again for another five years, <laughs> right? Wrong. <laughs> if you have spent any time talking with anyone from Capacity Interactive, come to boot camp in the past, or read the blog, you have likely heard us discuss an iterative approach to the design process. While this might sound like a new self-help program, <laughs> it's actually a natural continuation of the data-informed design process you just went through. With a typical approach to website redesign, we build a new site. We hopefully see sales increase, but as time goes on, performance starts to drop off. The site ages. We find that page templates no longer meet our needs. Um, and of course, changes in technology make certain site functionality obsolete. But because website redesigns are such a huge lift for all of the reasons that we've just discussed, we keep making the current site work until four or five years have passed, and then we start this project all over again. Look familiar? An iterative approach is different. It's evolution, not revolution. Rather than fully redesigning the site, you're making small changes on an ongoing basis to improve user performance. All of the tools that we have just discussed, so A-B testing, site surveys, your Google Analytics data, this can all help keep our sites functioning at a high level when we use them to inform an iterative approach to the design process. This year, 31% of organizations who responded to our benchmark study 
said they made incremental updates to the website once a year. 24% said they made updates less often. By a show of hands, how many people here have a budget line for website updates throughout the year? Okay, so maybe looking similar to what we saw in the benchmark study, maybe a little less. Um, and we know that this approach does require a shift in thinking. It requires us to be proactive rather than reactive. It requires budgeting yearly for those small website updates rather than just launching a large fundraising campaign every five years. And we know that these changes are hard, but if an iterative approach can give you consistent website performance that evolves to meet users' needs and means that we don't have to do one of these projects every five years, I think that we can all agree that it's worth it. To recap here for your photos. Um, <laughs> So we know that these projects are stressful and at times terror-inducing, but they should ultimately be beneficial and move your organization forward. We hope that the 10 things that we have walked through today were helpful, um, whether you are in the midst of a redesign or embarking on one in the future. So I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah. <laughs> Only questions that are not about the budget will be allowed. Oh, I'm gonna, hi, over here. Um, I had, I'm. Hi. Oh, there, hey, that's there you just go. really hard <laughs> to see. Yeah. So, unfortunately, I work, for, I work for a university and part of this whole process, yeah, uh, fun times, of is, laughter. you know, dealing with budgets on hold and things, but is there anything you could recommend that could be done like quickly, or I mean, not quickly, but like any, until you do a, a whole website redesign, do you have any suggestions for things you can do now or in the next few months? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about like now, now, like Monday now, but um, I mean, you can do like the small updates that we discussed and to identify what those things might be that would be most impactful, we would definitely recommend looking to as much data as you can gather about the site, I, I don't know if you sell tickets through the website or if, you know, what sort of the ultimate goals are there. Um, but looking at the pages or the page types that are underperforming the average for the site might be a place to start. Um, definitely anything like doing your user surveys is gonna take a little bit of time, but that is something that you can definitely do and like you would wanna do in advance of a redesign and that might help tell you what challenges people coming to the site are facing currently. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would focus on those things that are achievable but are gonna have the biggest impact on the site now. And just prioritize what those things are, see what you can get done, and you know, maybe make like a timeline of what seems reasonable. And then you'll have all of that information to use when you actually do go into a full design, whenever you know, the funds are available for that. And things like the mobile calculator that Kathleen shared yesterday, those, you know, that's gonna be maybe a, a large chunk of dollars that you're missing out on, so that could also you know, be convincing that the project should be put on the front burner as opposed to the back burner. Right here. Um, so many software projects are managed with in an agile approach um, as opposed to a more traditional waterfall product project management approach, um, which is what we are probably mostly familiar with in this room. Um, how can the organization project manager help an organization understand agile uh, and help people get on board with it? Um, I, th I think that, do you, do you mind just like, just for the room, just like yes, sure. defining agile versus waterfall. Sure. So waterfall is the more traditional project management process where you start with planning, and then requirements, and then building, and then launch, and that's mm -hmm. sort of the end of it. Where agile takes a more agile mm -hmm. approach, um, where there's more feedback mechanisms built into the project, and you can really iterate on 
a software project to make it better and better, which ties into the, the sort of ending of uh, iterating on design. Yeah, and I think from when I've heard developers and designers discuss that too, sometimes it's like focusing on certain page templates first and sort of like going through the process with that and then launching a page template with still sort of like housed in the traditional site structure. I don't know if that's similar to like what the project that you're discussing. I mean, I would say in terms of communicating that to a larger staff who's not familiar with those types of project management, I mean, I would look to the to the web partner that you're working with because like they're probably going to be most familiar with that structure of project management and see if they are willing to help communicate that. Because I mean, it seems like the biggest difference is really going to come down to um, expectations internally for what that is going to look like in terms of what people need to deliver based on the different project management styles. Um, and, your, and your website partner should be helping to communicate what those expectations are and how the other members of the staff can best help meet those expectations. Uh, this will be the last question. Actually, this uh, jumps off a little bit from the previous question, but um, we are a small-ish regional theater in the midst of a website redesign project, and we're in the design phase now. Um, but I'm wondering if you have any sort of pro tips and tricks for if you don't have an internal project manager and you are dealing with a project manager on your web partner side that is asking you how you're doing on things like content and you're having trouble sort of rallying the troops. Um, and I appreciated your ideas about establishing a working group and, um, uh, you know, and you know, stakeholders in the project, but um, we're having trouble right now sort of getting people to understand that content is everyone's responsibility and how, you know, do you have any, any tips for making that happen in a realistic way amongst the I staff? I mean, I, th I think that, you know, if, if you're up against a deadline of a launch, you're going to want to get all of the content moved on that deadline. Otherwise, your organization is going to be probably facing more charges with your, your website partner. So I would, you know, have a, have a frank meeting with people and really, you know, express that it's everyone's responsibility. And it, it does require, you know, like a lot of websites are, are now, we are in a time where we are like having more people work in the CMS and that is kind of like a, a change in thinking as opposed to like one person just controlling everything. And I think that it, it just can be helpful for like small changes too. Like it is useful <laughs> to have more people versed in, you know, what needs to happen and uh, able to make those changes. So, and also, like, if you can, you know, get some interns, like, like I was saying, it, it could also be another outlet. You know, you can hopefully get some interns to work for a little amount. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if, if there hasn't been someone internally who's been project managing it, um, obviously, like, you would want that person to have been involved throughout the whole process, but I would say maybe don't decide that it's too late to do it now just because you haven't had one in the past. Like, if there is a person who is invested, you know, be like, you're the project manager now for this phase, and, you know, <laughs> really try, because it does take someone internally who is the person who is, like, rallying everyone else, so I would say don't don't say that it's too late because you didn't have one before. Try to see if there's a person you can have sort of step into that role now. I think we're. Thank you all. Yeah.